Hello and welcome to the Judo Way of Life podcast. Today I'm joined again by Australian Olympian Matt DeQuino. Matt joined me for episode 8 of the podcast, so if you haven't listened to that one already, go back and check it out. But for today, we're going to tackle some other subjects, so let's get into it. Hello Matt, thank you for joining us again. Hey, thanks David, thanks for having me. So, last time we spoke, we focused a lot around sort of high-performance judo and your experience with the Olympics. What I talked to a bit more about today is you know, your experiences as a coach. And you've obviously got a, a huge library of technical resources online on YouTube and your, your technical DVDs. What prompted you to start filming and uploading your techniques to, say, YouTube? Yeah, yeah. So do you remember last time we talked, I talked about how Morgan showed me how to stop getting crushed versus on a left and right scenario? Yep. So it was on then that I was like, oh, well, if I don't know that and I've been, I'm a high-performance athlete, there must be people all over, over the place that don't know that. So I started filming videos and putting them online, and I just got so many positive comments of people saying, oh, thanks for that video, thanks for that video. I got heaps. I started getting emails, and I was like, oh, people actually like my content, and I seem to be helping a lot of people, so I'll just, just keep doing it. So I just kind of uh, started uploading uh, videos constantly. But, you know, all through, like, college and high school i always liked filming you know for like media class and that sort of stuff so kind of recording's always been like an interest of mine um and uh and so yeah so i just that's how i kind of started just started uploading videos and what i also so around at the same time i started doing personal training so one-on-ones like you do one-on-ones as well and you find sometimes you do a one-on-one with someone um maybe it's on osotagari and a few combinations in and out of osotagari then a week later, you're like, so do you remember what we did last week? And they're like, oh, not really. I'm like, oh. So what I started doing was is doing a session up with someone, filming a video, chucking it online, and then saying, hey, guys, if we do a one-on-one on Monday, just on Sunday or Monday morning, watch the videos online of what we did last week so you can refresh your memory. So we're not rehashing old content from last week. We can just keep progressing your kind of knowledge. And so that was also another reason why um, I started uploading content was just for my clients to – have a, a reference of, uh, of me teaching. Um, and then it just grew and grew. And I think now I've got like 700 on, on YouTube or something like that, close to that. And when you started, did you, did you envisage that you were going to develop into the, because you, you have your instructional videos and is it the University of Judo yeah. as well as the platform that you have? Was that something you, you'd planned out beforehand or is that something that just evolved as time went I, by? Yeah, it just evolved. Like a really good friend of mine, um, his uh, wife um, wrote one of the first paleo diet cookbooks to ever be released around the world. Um, and so she said, hey, Matt, like I write these cookbooks and I'll show you how to, because you've got a lot of content, you've got a lot of people emailing you, a lot of, you know, let's actually get a newsletter list for you so you can start sending emails to people. And I'll show you how to build a website. I'll show you how to do like send newsletters to people. I'll show you how to make a product and you can sell it online. And I was like, really? Like, who's going to buy my stuff? She goes, I don't know. Do you, but you may as well have a try. So my first product was uh, workoutsforjudo.com. Um, and um, it was just workouts that I did for training for the Olympics. So it's just all my kind of my fitness and conditioning programs for that. And I wrote that book and, and released it. And yeah, heaps of people bought it. And I couldn't believe it. Like, I think when I released it, um, maybe I, I think I released it at like maybe 3 a.m., which is midday in, in America, in LA. And someone bought it. It, you know, 11 minutes later. And I was like, whoa, like I, someone bought my product, you know, and um, that was kind of the start of, of, um, of um, making products. And, and yeah, so that was my first one. And then I did like strength training for judo. So like that's a judo strength.com, which is like just weight training. Um, and I just started just kind of whatever I'm good at. I just kind of thought, well, if I've got a knowledge in this because I'm a personal trainer as well, um, I may as well just kind of package it up and, 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 and just, give it to people or sell it to people for people who can actually really help them as well. So that's kind of how it all began, but I never thought it would end up being, um, yeah, what it is today. Like I didn't have a business model or a structure or anything like that. I was just literally just trying to help people and still trying to help people. Like I'm always like, what can help people rather than how can I make money? That's not definitely not the, um, the, the motivation. It's just like, how can I help people? And what you find is people will either email me a lot and it'll be a pretty common question or people at the club will be asking me common questions. And so then I'll write uh, content based on, on what questions people are asking. So, but yeah, I never thought it would be like, like that, like what it is now. So do you plan out 
your programs before you start filming? Or do you sort of have a rough idea and then see where it takes you? Uh, so when I'm doing a DVD for online, I always plan out what I'm doing. But what I never do is I never tell my Uki what I'm, what I'm teaching. So I never tell, usually it's Liam. I never say to Liam, hey, Liam, I'm going to teach this move next. I want you to react like this and I want you to do that. So often if you watch my DVDs, you'll, you'll see me go, I'm going to do this and do that. And then I'll say, oh, Liam actually reacted like this, in which case that wouldn't work. I'll have to do this instead. So I, I, they're not really, really rehearsed. Liam sometimes just, he sometimes goes, oh, sorry, man, I didn't react properly. I'm like, that's the point because that's judo. We don't know how people are going to react. So I plan my side of the DVD, but I never tell my Uki what I'm doing so that they, I have to think on the spot. It actually helps me teach it more. Because often you watch some videos online and you're like, that was not rehearsed, but you're in 100% control of your partner, where sometimes you're not. And so you got to be able to react. So, But yeah, for my content, I definitely plan it all out in advance and, and make sure it's you know succinct. So yeah, so I do plan it out. Because sometimes if you don't plan it out, you waffle on way too long. And in terms of your learning as a coach, how much has the teaching and doing the DVDs helped you develop your own judo as well, uh, like your own knowledge? Oh, so much, so much. Because you just you, because sometimes when you when you do randori, you sometimes are only looking for the judo that you like to do, and so although you can develop that really really far, there might be someone in your club that loves playing, you know, double sleeves, double lapels, and you actually know nothing about that. So by kind of playing those different styles, you start just learning more and more judo. So it's, it's it just, you just got to explore, really. So don't just get stuck with lapel and sleeve judo, whatever you play, but start exploring all the different groups and all the different throws. Sometimes I don't coach. So often I say to my students, Liam, what have you been learning lately? Like, what have you learned lately? Or Eric, what are you watching lately? What are you learning? And then they teach me stuff. So often, um, you know, they say, um, if you're talking, you're not learning, you know, so... Um, often I'll bear the sort of questions I ask some of my team, like, what have you figured out lately? What's the, the latest thing you figured out? And I go, I figured out if I pull the sleeve here, then I'll do this. And I'm like, that's pretty cool. So I, I'm constantly learning from my own students about um, judo because they're really big. I've got heaps of judo nerds where they're really massive students of the game and students of biomechanics and stuff like that. So I find I learn so much from my students just from asking, you know, what have you been learning? What have you been watching? What have you figured out lately uh, for your judo? And they teach me heaps. So I think that really helps as well. So, yeah. Well, following on from that, who inspires you then in terms of maybe players who have been or are on the international circuit perhaps? Yeah. So I think um, who inspires me? I think Ono. Obviously, Ono inspires me. Obviously, he's like double world champion, all the rest of it. But he's really developed his judo around his uchimata. So he's developed his game really, really well. Where you look at someone like a Maruyama, phenomenal Uchimata, but at the last Worlds, he had nothing. Only Uchimata and he has a Tomonagi. And I think every match except for the final, he went into golden score. Another one's Koga, same thing. Koga had an awesome COE. And you look at the, the like the 92 Olympics, no, even earlier, if you want to go earlier, like 89 Worlds, 91 Worlds, it was all COEs and Sodas and Koji Makakomis. But then by the time Atlanta came around, he was doing... Tomonagi, Koshigaruma, Uranagi, he's doing net, like his judo developed massively um, around because everyone figured out his main techniques. So I think the, those two definitely stand out as just um, incredible. Obviously, Nomura as well as another, just his mindset to win three Olympics in a row is just next level. And uh, the other person who inspires me is, you know, Ilio Verdi, the, you probably don't even know, the Italian guy, under 60 kilo player. And what I love about him is not necessarily his judo. But he's just his tenacity to like, he's always in wars and he always, I watched him for so long. He would come like seventh, ninth, seventh, fifth, seventh, third, fifth, third, second, first, fifth. Like he, he just kind of, I watched him work his way up the medal tallies and he's just a tough dude. So I really liked him as well, just for his character and, and that sort of stuff. And your, so one of your online handles is the Beyond Grappling. And my understanding is your club's also the same name. Yeah. Which one came first? Yeah, so Beyond, um, well, in actual fact, it started because um, I was a personal trainer and I said to my brother, oh, I've just got a personal training certificate and I want to start training people, but I don't know a business name. He goes, why don't you call it like Beyond Fit? And I said, to, he goes, why don't you call it like something like Beyond Fitness? Because you're teaching more than just fitness, right? You're teaching like goal setting and nutrition. And I was like, oh, yeah. 
So I initially started with Beyond Fitness. And then kind of like you, everyone knew me as the judo guy. So everyone came to me more for judo than for the strength and conditioning. And it makes sense. You know, in my state, there's probably, you know, 10,000 personal trainers and only three or two judo personal trainers, you know. So everyone, you kind of have the monopoly if you do that. And so then I switched it to beyond grappling, and, um, and which I was mainly just teaching judo. Then I got into jiu-jitsu. So then I was teaching judo, jiu-jitsu, strength and conditioning, you know, goal setting, nutrition. So it's just, you know, teaching more than just grappling. Yeah, so I think that's just really important. And then when I had to open my club, I was like, what do I call it? Because I, I kind of wanted to separate almost between the online and the club. But it's kind of hard to separate when it's, it's, it's coming out of who I am, which is those sort of things. I want to be teaching more than just judo and more than just jiu-jitsu. I want to be teaching people to be good people, people to be leaders, people to be honest, to be respectful to treat each other nicely. Like I, I want them to chase their goals and their dreams. And so that's where the beyond came in. And then, and then I thought, you know, what, I'll just call it beyond grappling club. And if we need to change it, we need to change it. So it's been six years now and it's just kind of stayed. And so I kind of think that's the reason why um, it's called beyond grappling. And sometimes at the start of, at the start of classes, we say, you know, who invented judo or if it's a jiu-jitsu class, who's invented jiu-jitsu, what country did it come from? What year was it invented? And sometimes I say, what's our club called? <laughs> And some kids don't know. They're like, oh, I don't know. I'm like, where do you? I don't even know. No, it's written on the wall. Uh, and then I'll say, why is it called Beyond Grappling? And the kids will go, oh, because you teach us more than judo. You teach us like self-defense and like how to be friendly and not. And like, yeah, that's that's the kind of the mind and the, the heart behind the kind of the names of Beyond Grappling and Beyond Grappling Club. So, yeah. I was setting up a judo club always in the sort of on the, on the cards for you in terms of the development. Or was that something again that just sort of just came about from transitioning from an athlete? It was never on the cards. Like, and I think it's starting to become on the cards for, for people to go, I'm going to start a club as a business and make money where, you know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, it wasn't really a thing. But uh, so at high school, I wanted to go to Olympics. Obviously, I want to go to Olympics for judo. That was my main goal. And I remember teachers used to say, you've got to choose something that makes you money. I was like, I don't want to make money. I want to go to Olympics for judo. I want to win the Olympics. You know, like, that's all I want to do. And then... um. They were like, you've got to choose a problem. Because I just chose, like, at, at high school and college, I just ticked, like, full-time athlete. And they'd be like, well, you're not going to make any money, Judah. I'm like, that doesn't matter. I just want to go, you know. And then they said, and I said, choose a job. And I was like, I find then strength and conditioning coach. And they're like, well, that's not in the, the booklet that it has all the, you know, different careers you can choose. And I was like, okay, well. Uh, and so then I became a personal trainer. And then uh, after my Olympic, after Beijing, I went to uni to become a primary school teacher. Because I always like working with kids. Like my first jobs was like working at a indoor uh, birthday party place where I ran birthday parties and I worked at before and after school care and holiday programs. So I like it working with, working with kids. So kind of six or seven years at uni, I became a because I did it part time, became a primary school teacher, and then um, and then and then uh, I was running um, classes at my coaches club, the Hills uh, in Hill Sports Academy. And I was running classes there for seven years. And then one of my friends was like, Matt, you know, I'm a purple belt in jiu-jitsu. I've had, you know, 10 MMA fights. Do you want to just start running around gym? And I was like, yeah, all right, let's do it. So I kind of said to the hills, look, I think I'm going to run my own place. And they're like, oh, yeah, cool. No worries. Like, go for it. And then um, that kind of fell through. And then I was like, hey, guys, it kind of fell through. Like, can I just keep working here? They're like, yeah, man, go for it. Because <laughs> they're so chill. The hills are great. And so um, and so I just kept working. And then um, my son, Xander, uh, Rocky was born, and uh, and I was like, their club was about thirty minutes from where I live, and I was just telling someone the other day, like in where I live, a thirty minute drive is like so far, like in, in where I live, people don't drive, like they drive five to fifteen, maybe twenty minutes to work, anything further, and they're like thirty minutes, oh, it's too far, I'm not coming, I'm not going, like, so um, when I when my son was born, I was like, oh, what are like maybe run my own club. And I had a slightly different coaching style to my coaches. Um, I, um, I just have a different style. And one of the big catalysts for me starting my own club as well. So firstly, my son was born and I wanted to spend more time not driving to and from the club to run classes. That was the first one. Secondly, um, I had a different coaching style to them. But the third one was I was at an AIS, which is like Australian Institute of Sport, mastermind group with like, it was with boxing, taekwondo, judo and i think it was wrestling so it was all the combat sports and we had to put together a a, a 
I guess, a blueprint of how we thought we could get an Olympic gold medal. And so I put together my blueprint with my group and I presented my blueprint to my group and the boxing coach just goes, that'll never work. I was like, what do you mean it'll never work? It's, how do you think it's never going to work? He goes, well, you don't run your own club, mate. You work for someone else. So all, like all your ideas and stuff are great and I agree with a lot of it. But the fact of the matter is, is all the people you coach aren't your athletes, they're your boss's athletes. And so you, this is never going to happen unless you run your own club where you're the boss and you're in control of the direction of the classes, the direction of the vision and the mission and the values of the club or else it's not going to work. And I was like, wow, that's uh, pretty wise words. <laughs> and so that was the catalyst to then go, you know, I think I'll start my own place. I had the skills to do it. And so I started my own club. Yeah, maybe six months later. As when you say you had a different style of coaching, yeah, how would you describe your style? I think I, I the hills are more, you know, the Mighty Ducks, the Bash Brothers. You know, yeah. you know the Mighty Ducks movie. Yeah. The hills are like the Bash Brothers, so they love <laughs> tons of randori. They're really tough, like they're just tough dudes. Where I'm more, oh, let's talk about this technique and we'll figure it out. You know how this sort of works. And so there was sometimes I, I not a clash, but there was just you know it was just a different uh, uh, vibe. To, to me, you know, even though I'm, I heal at heart, I've been there. Yeah, my coach has been my coaches for you know 25 years or even longer. But uh, in terms of running a, a classes and stuff, I'm more of that nerdy kind of talk about it, where they're more the Bash Brothers style guys. So yeah, as you've developed as a coach, I suppose maybe this would be as a aimed as a, an advice to people that are maybe thinking about coaching in terms of learning and you know maybe resources that you use. Can you maybe go into that? Resources to coach? Oh, yeah. Well, or maybe like sort of qualifications because, you know, I've gone through the coaching system here in, in New South Wales and in, in Great Britain. I don't know if it's different in the territory that you're in. Yeah. Or sort of like a pathway for coaching. Yeah. So I think you've got to be like nationally accredited to coach. So firstly, your insurance has to cover you being a coach. If something happens, you have to make sure that you're qualified to coach. So there's heaps of different coaching courses you can do and that sort of stuff. Obviously, like first aid, police checks, and that sort of stuff. But I think in the end of the day, um, and there's actually a thread going on at the moment in one of the judo forums uh, for Australia. In the end, people just want you to care about them and care for them and, and know them and know their name and know who they are. That's how you become a good coach is by genuinely caring for them. So I think that's – if you focus on all the skills of coaching, but the skills of coaching are just skills, but really coaching is about people skills. It's about relationship. It's about actually caring for people. I think that's where a lot of coaches go wrong is they focus on, I went to the Olympics, I've got a black belt, I do this coaching course, I know what I'm talking about, rather than actually caring for the people they coach. So I think that's really, really important. And my friend Stephen Brown, he once said, do you want a coach that knows 100% and is willing to give you 10% of that? Or do you want a coach that knows 10% and is willing to give you 100% of that? You know. So I was like, I really took that on board. I was like, yeah. People really want a coach that gives their all to them, not withholding or whatever. So um, so in terms of pathway, though, I was a nationally accredited coach and state coach and that sort of stuff. And then make sure you get the police checks, the first aid, the CPR, and then um, you can start kind of coaching. And once you made the decision, you, you know, you set your own place up. How did you go about finding a suitable venue? Did you have any sort of specific requirements that you were looking for? Yeah, you just kind of, well, when you're starting out, I always tell people you just got to look for the cheapest place possible because um, it's harder to get members than you think. Like most people think, I'll just get a shop front, I'll put a sign out the front and people will just come through the doors, but it, it doesn't work like that. Um, it's uh, harder to get members than you think. So really aim your budget as if you don't, like you're not, like it's going to be harder than you think. So I think that's the first one. So for me, rent a local, so the church that I go to, they have an auditorium space that's only used on a Wednesday, on a Wednesday night, and a Sunday for church. So I said, hey, do you guys mind if I rent the uh, facility, I'll rent the auditorium space to run my judo club? And they said, yeah, no worries. So I started out with just three days a week because I was still primary school teaching at a school. And then in the afternoons, I'd work at the club. Um, Mondays, I used to run Monday, Thursdays, and Saturdays. And, um, and I would set up the mats and then pack them up. And I did that um, for ages because the Rent is cheaper, and I just started out really small and kind of built up. And I kind of the advice I give people is if to start small, find a scout hall, a church, a community center, and start small, 
because if you and maybe run five classes a week, and if you can't fill five classes a week after a year, then you then you probably can't run a club full time with you know ten grand a month rent or five grand a month rent or whatever it is. So it's a really good indicator as whether you can actually run your own facility is by starting out small. If you can't grow three classes to ten or fifteen people, you probably can't grow a club to pay you a decent enough income to you know survive the rent uh, that's around the place with your club is that how you started to sort of five classes a week yeah i'm assuming split between adults and and kids and then how did you market you yeah. know when you were opening up how did you market in the beginning so i just marketed so i did kids classes teenage classes adults and then i did jiu-jitsu so i did four classes on monday four on thursday two on saturday and then what i used i did i i, I made flyers and i walked the streets of the suburb where my dojo is and I put rather than putting them in letter boxes, I made um, I bought uh, I can't remember what they're called but the little bags with a door handle hole through them and you put the flyer inside the door handle bag and you put it on the door handle of houses. So if you put a, a, a flyer in the letter box, people just open the letter box and put it in the bin. but if you put a flyer on their front doorstep on the door handle when they come home, they have to pick it up and look at it. So that way you're going to catch way more people to see your flyers. So I did that um, and I just walked the streets for hours. Probably I did probably three hours a day, um, five, six days, you know, five days a week for months. And I just walked the all the surrounding suburbs and I just did that and just listened to podcasts. I did that. So it was part of my work. Uh, and then, but that's the first one. The second one is you when you start off a club, you're the only person, you're the only member. So you're the only person that can tell others about your club. And so you're the first port of call. So I always tell people to get a hoodie or a jumper or a jacket with your club on it and wear it every day. So when you go to the shops, when you go to the post office, people ask you about judo and you go, yeah, I run the club down the road and your kids will love it. And then so you're the kind of driving force to, to gain the members. And then once you get members, they start telling other members and you can just grow from there. Yeah, but it's, it's harder than you think to get members. So when I started, um, I had zero people, like zero, not one person. So I had my first session, um, I put out all the mats and then someone turned up at five to four and we're like, hey, uh, can we do judo? I was like, of course you can. And they're like, so how long have you been here for? I'm like, five minutes? Like it just started. Uh, you're our first member. So they signed up. That was one. And then I had my two nieces. That was two, I guess. And then that, you know, and then that was for a four o'clock class. Five o'clock class, no one came. Six o'clock class, no one came. 7.30 class, no one came. I just pack up and go home. So you just sit around at the club for three hours waiting for someone to come and they didn't. And I just did that for weeks on end, having one student in a class or sometimes no one would even turn up. On a weekend, I'd set up the mats, wait, no one would come, I'd wait an hour, no one would come, I'd pack up, drive home, all grumpy. <laughs> Why'd I start this stupid business anywhere? No, I'm such a good coach and nice guy, no one's even coming. Uh, but slowly, slowly people come, it just takes time. When I say that no members came, what I mean is that I had some of my family members come to training and I had another family, the Watkins family, but outside of that, I had zero members come with me. So I started literally from scratch, except for those handful of the Watkins family and a handful of my own family members as well. Even my wife had to get on the mat just to make up numbers. And she uh, was proud to get a white yellow belt after a term and a half. So, uh, yeah. And as a coach, obviously, these people are coming, the novices, you know, maybe sometimes some people may have had some experience, but I'm guessing for the most part, they're all white belts, never done any kind of judo or yeah. uh, judicial before. As a coach, how do you sort of manage your expectations of that to allow the club to develop? Oh, great question. So pretty much once you run a club, you don't become – it's it's not about you, it's about them. So if you want to do Randori and – well, it depends. If you start a club and you can bring five black belts with you, you can still have Randori classes, right? Or But if you, if you start a club and there's only white belts, we can only teach at white belt level. So we didn't do Randori for a year at my club. Because white belts can't throw white belts and white belts can't break ball. So it's like a white belt throwing a white belt is like just injuries waiting to happen. And I didn't have a crash mat. I wish I bought a crash mat, but I didn't. So that also made it a bit trickier. So I recommend buying a crash mat um, because you can then get some really hard throws in and it doesn't hurt them. Um, now, yes, you can focus on break falls and all that, which you do, but it just takes time. Um, yeah, so the expectation is just, yep, you, you're done randorying and it's time to teach them. And so that's what you kind of do. And we sort of touched on it then when you say obviously white belts can't do 
you know, break falls and you know managing that side of things. I suppose we all know that break falls is that one of the first things any any coach should be teaching any new new player. Mm. But once you get the break falls, wh- where do you go from there? Like, what's your sort of go to first technique to teach someone? Oh, it's, it could be anything. It doesn't matter. You can teach them what you matter. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. I think you can teach anyone any technique anytime. But um, if you if you want, actually, maybe not. Maybe I delete that sentence. You can teach. <laughs> Well, yes and no. So at my club, when a beginner comes, if we're doing Uchimata that session, they do Uchimata. If we're doing Osa to go, they do Osa to go. If we're doing Ambas, they do Ambas. If, because what happens is when you run a club, uh, some new person comes, I want to try a judo. You know worries. And then most clubs do this. Hey, here's assistant coach Black Belt. Go with him to the side of the mat. Do break falls for half an hour. And the dude's like, or the girl's like, how come I'm over here doing break falls by myself and they're all over there having way more fun doing actually what I came to do, right? Then they they come into the class later and they feel awkward because they've missed the first 30 minutes of the class because they've been doing break on the side. So they have, they have an experience where it's the, they're left out completely of the classes um, and so it doesn't give them the best experience. So that's the, so we don't do that at our club. We they go straight into the classes. You just manage it. You just you just kind of go, hey guys, we do. You know, if it's two lines down the middle of the mat, you're doing uchikomi. You go, hey guys, I'm going to quickly teach you this throw. You're going to do this throw. Everyone, hey everyone, and they say the new person's name is Charlie. Hey everyone, Charlie's going to throw you. You're not going to throw them. Everyone go, yeah, sweet, no worries. Then Charlie is part of the class. They're having fun. They're meeting people, and uh, they're having way more fun. So that's kind of how we run it at our club. Secondly, it's really cool because Charlie might turn up to the club. You give the assistant instructor black belt to take them for the whole hour class, then they never come back. So you've just wasted an assistant instructor to spend an hour with this person. They never came back anyway. So that's how we run it at our club. And it's way better because they make friends, they meet people, they're partnering black belts, they're partnering green belts, they're part of the team. Imagine turning up to a soccer practice to be part of the team and they go, oh, you don't know how to kick a soccer ball, so go over there by yourself. And we're going to teach you how to kick a ball uh, or run around, and then you can join the team in half an hour. It just, it's awkward. So that's how we do it at our club, and I think it works really well. Um, so sometimes I don't even teach them how we exist. Sometimes we don't even teach beginners break falls first. They, why do they need to know a break fall first? They just, you just make sure they don't get thrown. <laughs> like you just run the class so they don't get thrown. And you just tell everyone, don't throw Jimmy. Okay, and no one throws Jimmy, but he can – move around the mat and that sort of stuff. So we really, that's how we run it. So it's the skill of the teacher to um, be facilitating that really well. So that's kind of how we run it. What do you think about that idea? Yeah, I agree with you there. That's how I try and coach, especially with kids. I just want yeah. to get them involved as quickly as possible. Uh, yeah. Maybe just run through the sort of break falls just like so quickly, just to give them a bit of a rough idea. Yeah. But then, yeah, just try and get them involved as quickly as possible. And now what, what most people do is they teach a back break fall. Yep. That's cool. When have you seen a kid do a back break fall in a judo class? Yeah, fair point. Never, never. Okay, side break fall. You teach them a side break fall? The side break fall they do in Randuri is not a side break fall they do on their own. So it's also irrelevant. Forward break fall, forward rolling break fall. When do they do that in kids' class? Never, unless they're doing a warm-up while you do relays, but never in Randuri. So all three break falls we teach are essentially an irrelevant skill. How many kids do you know who – you say do a side break fall and they can't do it. Then you go come here and you throw them and they do a normal break fall. They do a perfect break fall. Try it next time. Next time you're at the club, say to a kid, do a side break fall. When they do it wrong, say, come here, throw them with Taitoshi. I guarantee they'll land with a perfect break fall. And you go, what would you rather have? A kid that can do a solo break fall, but not a partner break fall or a break fall in Mandora. You'd rather that. So you know, it's just really interesting. Um, so anyway, that's why I don't. We don't overly spend a ton of time on it. Obviously, the main skill of a break fall is chin on chest and don't and don't search for the mat by sticking your hand out. But the actual the side break fall you do on your own is not the side break fall that happens when you get thrown. I think there's an overly interesting point that you sort of raised there as well, where you know you explain the context of the exercise. Yeah. And that's something I try and do as a coach because as a kid. One of my, I was an absolute pain in the ass for my teachers because I'd always be asking why. So I'd want to sort of know where, you know, where this, what, wherever it was, had come from, where, and where we were going with it. So I try and 
implement that into my coaching. Like you say, you know, you, you explained why we do a side break fall, or you know, you can all let you sort of link it into how it's applicable. Yeah, and that's something I try and do when I'm coaching. So you know, give the kid a, some context so they understand either the importance of the exercise. So sometimes the warm up exercise, you sort of like, well, why are we doing this? Yeah, and they don't sort of some like understand how it fits into the actual into judo. For me, like the warm up, I always try and make sure everything's relevant. Yeah. It has some kind of crossover. It's not just for the sake of doing something. Yeah. So you, you've, you've had your club, you said, for six years? Yeah. Six years in October. So, yeah, six years in next week, a week after. How long was it before, I don't want to say successful, but how long before it was running at a, at a level where you were able to live comfortably, should we say? Oh, I don't know. So I covered costs in my first term of setting it up, but... In terms of financially viable, you mean? Where was it when the club became, you know, the regular players turning up every week, yeah. every session had people turning up? I don't know the exactly of when that happened. Like, because some classes are more empty than others. So some, sometimes one week you'll have 10 and the next week you'll have three. So it's kind of just, you know, some days you come home like, Dude, Sam, you know, my wife, Sam, so we had 10 kids in the four o'clock class and five kids in the teenage class and, Two kids, two people were adults, and then but we had 10 for jiu jitsu, and then the next week is completely different. So, um, I don't know exactly when, but I think, um, I think just seeing kids' lives change and adults having fun that's when you know you're successful. So, I think all judo clubs to an extent are successful because they're teaching people judo. So, every judo club, whether they've got 10 members or 10,000, they're all successful because we're hopefully teaching people something that's going to change their life, you know. So, I think, um, all clubs are successful. Yeah, but I don't know exactly how many months it took to get kind of consistent. But you kind of want to get at least 10 people in a class. 10 people means um, the students bring the energy to the class rather than the coach having to bring the energy to the class. So if you can get 10 people to every class, that's awesome. Sometimes classes lower than 10 are the hardest ones to run. Once they're above 10, it becomes easier. And how did you keep yourself motivated to keep turning up? In the beginning, when those sessions, say you turning up and there were no one was turning up to the class, it's literally just hope. It's hope, but also I, I did a lot of things that I hoped would be beneficial long term. So I walked the streets for hours, handing out flyers. I posted on Facebook. So if you only have three people to a class, I was like this oh, I could take a photo of the kids' class, but I've got three kids and the club up the road has 20 on the mat. How embarrassing, right? So you start comparing to other clubs. So I was like, rather than taking a photo of the class and saying, oh, what a great kids' class and there's three kids, I would just write, such a great kids' class today. Uh, We focused on hip throws and hold downs. It was so much fun. The kids had a blast. And I just put text. So then if you do that on Facebook, people that want to search your business will see, they don't even know how many members you've got, but they'll see what you're doing and how much fun it was because you're saying it was fun. Um, so doing that sort of stuff, the marketing, and just you just got to stick it out for as long as you can. And uh, the other thing I did was when um, people sign up, you give them a two-week free trial to give to a friend. And so they sign up too, maybe, or maybe they don't. <laughs> Who knows? So I don't know. You just got to just keep plugging away. And... Where do you see your club going? So you're obviously six uh, six years in now. Are you looking to expand from where you are or take it in a different direction? Yeah. Look, I think we're at the point now where um, we, we're now – for years we just had everyone in one class. But now we've split into interme- uh, fundamentals adults classes and uh, advanced adult classes. And we've got advanced kids teams classes now where there's all the competition kids that were really keen on comps or the competitive kids. So we're really starting to separate and starting to kind of um, have different avenues of where people can be successful. So what I'm really looking at doing is really focusing now on um, the, the adults we have to really focus on the goals that they have for tournaments once tournaments come back after lockdown. Really want to be focusing on the, essentially on all avenues of judo. We want to be focusing on kata, um, competition, recreation, coaching. And so actually trying to just kind of streamline each of those um uh i guess facets of the club is where i really want to get to so it's not saying we'll be successful when we get an olympian no 
We're saying we'll be successful when we have a program where we've got a team trying to make the Olympics. Okay, we're, we're going to have a really, really successful when we have a group of kids that want to do judo forever recreationally. That's going to be successful. We're going to be successful when some of those kids that have natural coaching talent, they're going to start coaching classes. So that sort of stuff is kind of where I see um, our club going, which is pretty exciting. So I essentially want to be a club known for, you know, there's some clubs, that's a competitive club, that's a recreational club. You know, I want to be a club that's known for not just one thing, but known for firstly our culture of being really friendly, but also being good at judo, but actually having kind of a club that has just so many different avenues that whoever comes to the club can slide in somewhere. Whether you do jujitsu, whether you do judo, whether you're doing it for fun, whether you're doing it for competition, whether you're doing it for coaching or refereeing, our club has a place for you. Have you ever considered franchising the club and setting up other uh, locations? Uh, yeah, yes and no. Some people have said, can we be a, you know affiliate to be on Grappling Club and that sort of stuff? But uh, I, I kind of just don't, you can't, fran- franchising is a funny one because we're in a people business. We're not in a service or a product business. So you can't streamline culture. You can't, can't franchise culture and you can't franchise values and you can't franchise vision and mission. You can fran- you franchise vision and mission, but not values and culture. So if you wanted to start a Beyond Grappling Club in Sydney, well, you could, but it's, it's not really going to be the same probably because we're different people, right? different uh, values and, 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 and culture. It's going to be different. And so when I think franchise, I think franchising is where it's this. When I go to Macca's, it's the same. When I go to KFC, it's the same. Or Nando's, it's the same because it's just a product, but it's not a people business. It's different. So, yeah, and I plus I just don't like that, you know, jiu-jitsu, there's a lot of kind of infighting with franchise. and just gets really I know, financially involved, doesn't it? And I just, I'm not a big fan of that. Um, style of of money making that sometimes happens in jiu-jitsu so i'm assuming then from that the, the jiu-jitsu you run at your club is is not an affiliate to another we're affiliated with uh jiu-jitsu kingdom in sydney but it's a great relationship because i'm not paying a monthly subscription to philippe my coach we're not it's not like that it's just more of a a, a coach club relationship but it's not i guess a financial one and that sort of stuff so it kind of just really helps keep things in a great place rather than a financial place where it can get kind of a bit iffy, I find. Quite often when money gets involved, it starts to get a bit iffy. Yeah, that's right. And, yeah, it's, a, it's a, just a funny world, isn't it? And, you, yeah. yeah, when money gets involved, people go crazy. That's what I've figured out. When money's involved, people change, you know, and so it's important to kind of firstly pay people what they're worth, so value people, and but also um, so it's just a tricky one. So, yeah. And how do you find that the, the jiu-jitsu – integrates in with your club so i'm assuming primarily you're a, you're a judo club first and then the jiu-jitsu is a component but not the main component at some clubs like there's you know and you'd know them as well like some clubs are all around the world all around the world they might be a primarily a kickboxing club with jiu-jitsu on the side or they might be a jiu-jitsu club with kickboxing on the side um but either way there's going to be a sport that will become the little brother that hey guys um you know, kickboxing is not on tonight because jiu-jitsu is running a seminar. And the kickboxing guys are like, oh, well, jiu-jitsu takes precedence. So for me and my club, I've always been really trying to be on top of not separating judo and jiu-jitsu. So in actual fact, my club, we run more adults jiu-jitsu classes than we do judo. So for the adults, we're more of a jiu-jitsu club than we are judo. But for kids, we're more ju- uh, judo. But for teenagers, we, got, we run two jiu-jitsu teenage classes and only three judo ones for teenagers adults we run i think six jiu-jitsu classes and for adults judo we only run four and so anyway so when people say how many members do you have at judo i always give the full amount i always give my judo and jiu-jitsu because we're one club we're one family we're one vision we're one mission one we're one values we're one everything so that's kind of how i look at it so i kind of think also one reason why i call it grappling is I think that jiu-jitsu is just an extension of judo. If judo didn't become an IJF Olympic, IOC, an IJF Olympic sport, the progression into Nerwaza in judo is exactly what jiu-jitsu is. It's, jiu-jitsu is judo without the rules that stopped the growth of it. So for me, judo and jiu-jitsu is one and the same thing. 
for some people it's not. It's very separated, but for me it's the same art, different sport. And so um, we teach all of it. And I think more and more clubs are going that way now where they're teaching, they're not teaching judo classes, they're just teaching uh, Nerwaza classes. So it's not judo or jiu-jitsu, it's just today we're teaching stand-up and tomorrow we're teaching groundwork and it's not judo or jiu-jitsu, it's just stand-up and groundwork. And there's no, we don't call it one or the other. It's just, that's just what it is, um, which I really like. Yeah, something I run, I run a couple of hybrid, call them just hybrid classes because the lunchtime classes, we get, you know, we got a bit of a smaller sort of, sort of reach in terms of people turning up. So instead of going one way or the other by calling it hybrid, we, you know, we capture people that are, you, you know, um, more judo based or more BJJ based, but they all come together. And it also affords us the, the luxury because the classes are a little bit smaller of working transition. Yeah. So it's one of the it's one of the few sessions at the club where we're actually able to train transition properly instead of it being so like Niwaza, Randori, yes. and then all right, that's it, four times five minutes, and then we won't get a drink, and then we'll do standing, and there's that that gap in between in terms of uh, developing the transition. Oh, so big it's, time. One of, it's one of the few classes where we can actually you know the players can work on that uh, you know do work on that transition. Something yeah. I'm big on is uh, sort of positive throwing, and then as soon as you go to the ground, it's you know carry on so yeah awesome so for you what's been the best thing about being a coach oh so many things so many different things i had a kid sometimes it's just let's say it's all different so having some of my students become coaches and seeing how good they are at coaching i'm just amazed i'm like oh my gosh you're such a good coach you're better than me like you're just amazing that's the first one secondly i love seeing people take almost a, allowing a culture uh, that allows people to take ownership of their own judo. So I love that as well. Um, thirdly, I love just teaching kids life skills. Like, hey, man, you have to have a shower more often than once a week. Like, give it. So I had one kid who had really long toenails. And I said, hey, man, go cut your toenails. He's about, you know, 11 or 12. Go cut your toenails. And he, he goes over and he picks up the toenail clippers and he's looking at them like with a weird look on his face. I said, Luke, what are you doing? He goes, oh, I'm just cutting my toenails. I said, get started. And he like didn't say anything. He's just looking at it. So I went over there. I said, who cuts your toenails at home? He goes, mum does. I said, well, guess what, mate? Today's the day you're going to grow up. Sit down. I'm going to do your big toe and you're going to do the others. He goes, oh, okay, no worries. So this is how you do it. This is how they work. Cut his toe, big toe and he did the rest. I'm like, that's what it's all about. It's got nothing about judo. This kid has finally grown up a little bit. And he needs a judo coach to give him some hard work. He's like, mate, you can do this yourself, buddy. Like, you're 12 now. You've got to stop letting your mum do this stuff. So I kind of, like, for me, I was like, it's a character win, you know. It's not just about judo. It's about the character win. Or, or what I also love about coaching is um, you might, because I was a primary school teacher, I know a lot of just people in the community that are teachers. They go, oh, do you know so-and-so? I go, yeah, yeah, they go, they said judo your club has been the best thing for this child like they really need consistent positivity and your club's just the best thing for them so i just love the fact that our club is just helping so many people and uh or an adult saying hey man i've had a rough trot this last year like with depression and anxiety and the club here and the guys at the club have just really helped me through my mental health stuff so i just want to thank thanks heaps for running such a great place and you go, that's what it's all about. It's got nothing to do with Olympic medals and nationals and all this stuff. That's what it's about. It's about people growing up, people setting goals, people actually having a better life through what the culture that we have, not even the, what we're teaching them, but the culture that we have. So that's what I love about coaching. It's all that stuff. And what would your advice be to someone who was maybe thinking about starting their own judo club or um, jiu-jitsu club? Yeah. What would your advice to them be? My biggest advice is when you run a club, it's, a, it's, it, it's the pe- you're in the people business. So do you like people? Do you like being around people? Do you like, do you just like people? Are you a friendly person to be around? Do people want to be around you? Because if not, it's a lot harder to run a club. Now, it depends. If you, if you want to run a club that's got 30 or 40 or 50 people, that's fine, but you're not going to make a full-time income out of that. So it all depends on what sort of club you want to run. That would be the first one. And the second one would be what sort of coach are you? Are you a really friendly, easygoing coach or are you a coach that it's my way or the highway and I'm the boss and I'm the black belt and you've got to do, 
you go, I'm going to tell you what to do when you're going to do it, or you're a bit more humble, like, hey, man, I don't know anything, but I'm willing to learn and let's learn in this together and that sort of stuff. So I think um, that would be my advice. Do you like people? Do people like you? I think that's a big one. And then what sort of a leader? And also what sort of leadership skills do you have? Like are you good at delegating warm-ups or do you have absolute control over everything and, um, and that sort of stuff? So I guess there's a lot of self-reflection about you as a person. How do you go with awkward conversations when people are slapping on arm bars and, and you have to tell them off or, you know, they're, they're wearing geese that's they're too dirty? How do you go at difficult conversations and stuff like that? Because that's what happens when you run a club um, is you have to kick people out. You have to tell people they can't come back. You have to tell people that they've missed payments. It's all that sort of stuff that is, um, it's got nothing, running a club's got nothing to do with judo. It's got to do with the business side of things, if you want to run it for profit. So yeah, they're the questions I'd be asking. And what's been the biggest learning curve for you since starting your own club? The biggest learning curve? Hmm, what have I had to really learn? I've learned everything, I think. Like I've read a ton of books and I guess I haven't had a, a hard What's a hard learning curve? What have I really struggled with? Yeah. Hmm. I think the hardest thing is those awkward conversations to maintain culture is the hardest thing because that because you can't be a people pleaser. If you're a people pleaser, people will walk all over you. So you've got to have difficult conversations and you've got to be humble. I had a situation where I told someone off, but in retrospect, I think I was in the wrong. So then... I talked to someone else. I said, yeah, man, I think you're in the wrong. They had to go and apologize. Hey, really sorry. Read the situation all wrong. I'm really sorry. So being really humble, but actually having awkward conversations, I think is the hardest thing I've had to learn with running my business. But it's all learning. Like that's it. If, you, if you're willing to learn, which I am, and I'm re- I read a lot of books, so I ask a lot of questions, and that's helped me learn a heap. And I think also having good mentors. So my friend Stephen Brown in Adelaide, we did judo trips for 10 years together. And he's just a phenomenal business owner. And he, I've learned so much from him over the years. Before I even ran a club, we, he was always running businesses and stuff. So always asking him questions. So I was able to learn heaps from him. Oh, fantastic. Really appreciate your time again, Matt. Thoroughly enjoyed that conversation. Some real, real nice bits of insight there. You know, worries. thanks for having me. And can I, can I give my little BJ Fanatic DVD thing a plug? Can I do that? May of course. Hey, listeners. Um, me and David didn't even kind of talk about what we're going to talk about today. And he's like, well, I want to talk about this. I'm like, I just filmed, I, 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 have, I filmed it over the last three days, a DVD, which is how to start and maintain a Judo and Jiu-Jitsu Academy. It'll be up on Judo and BJJ Fanatics in the next little while. But I've just, I've just kind of rendered all the video. It's four hours long. So I'll cu- cut it down. It should be about three and a half hours. And I go through absolutely everything you need to know to run a club. So a lot of the stuff we've talked about, but obviously another three hours worth of content how to find a logo, what, what vision, mission, values, awkward conversations, how to run a class, how to run a rotating curriculum, how to deal with behavior management. I, absolutely everything you need to know to run a dojo, marketing, all my email and processes and that sort of stuff. So if you want to run a club, either shoot me an email and I uh, will find that and I'll give you the link to that product when it's up live soon, whenever that may be. So yeah, but thanks to David for the chat. Like I said, I'll, I'll talk about you all day. I love it. Yeah, no good. Thank you very much. Pretty appreciate your time. Cheers, Matt. Thanks, mate.